Welcome to the SSPX podcast and to the SSPX interview series. Today, we're speaking with Father William McGilvery on a topic that has gained renewed attention in recent days, the question of a possibility of a heretical pope. What happens if a pope speaks heresy? This has been a topic of controversy over the course of the pontificate of Pope Francis, and it has only grown following a recent audience given by the Holy Father. So we're going to look at the statement he made during this general audience. Was it heretical? And if it was, then what does that mean? Does it mean he loses the papacy automatically? Many saints and theologians have discussed this issue over the centuries, but only in a theoretical manner. So is there a theological or a legal basis for the Pope losing his office? This is the longest interview we've done because it is such a complex topic, but Father McGilvery has put together a comprehensive overview so we can determine once and for all how Catholics should view the possibility of a heretical Pope. Let's join Father now. Well, Father McGilvery, thank you for joining us on this special episode of the SSPX podcast. Um, how are things going up in the school around this time of year, Father? Uh, very well, thanks. We're still in the middle of winter, so it was a good negative 20 degrees out this morning, Celsius, of course, um, when yep. I went to get into the car to drive to St. Peter's and St. Mass. But um, we are heading towards the end of the third quarter, and um, the finish line is in sight. <laughs> Great. Great. Well, it's always good to have that last little bit set. Absolutely. Um, something to look forward to. That's right. Um, uh, well, Father, we wanted to have you on to talk about something that has been in the news uh, recently. Um, there was a general audience of Pope Francis uh, where he said some surprising things about the communion of saints. Mm -hmm. um, and it has caused some controversy. It has caused a lot of discussion especially online, shocking, uh, among uh, traditional Catholics, among conservative Catholics. Um, and this is just one more in kind of a long line of some of these statements from Pope Francis that leave many people scratching their heads, maybe even doubting the papacy. Um, bottom line, it has come out and it is something that has caused a lot of people to start to move further along the line of being set of a contest uh, if they weren't already there. Um, so we wanted to have this discussion with you, Father, and, and basically ask the question, how do we understand these sorts of statements, and in particular, this statement recently made by Pope Francis? So I don't know if you want to read it, Father, if you'd like me to. Yeah, so I'd be happy to um, just read the essential parts of the quotation, which I think we're all familiar with. Um, it's from a general audience that Pope Francis gave on the 2nd of February of this year. Um, and he made some rather shocking statements. Um, he said, for example, that the church is the community of saved sinners. Uh, this is a beautiful definition. No one can exclude themselves from the church. We are all saved sinners. Um, so that seems to be denying uh, the truth taught by the, the ordinary and universal magisterium that um, not everyone belongs to the Church of Christ, but rather only the baptized who continue to profess the Catholic faith and um, uh, submit themselves to the authority of the Roman pontiff and those those bishops in communion with him. Um, so that would be seem to be a denial of of the um, you know the common and universal teaching of the church regarding membership. Um, and then Pope Francis goes on to say certain other troublesome things, such as that, um, so he says, let us consider, dear brothers and sisters, that in Christ no one can ever truly separate us from those we love, because the bond is an, an existential bond, a strong bond that is in our very nature. Um, only the manner of being together with each of them changes, but nothing and no one can break this bond. And then he poses a, a rhetorical question to himself. Um, the question is, Father, let us think about those who have denied the faith, who are apostates, who are persecutors of the church, those who have denied their baptism. Are these also at home, meaning at home in the church? And he responds to this rhetorical question. Uh, yes, these two, even the blasphemers, everyone, we are brothers. This is the communion of saints. So those are his statements, and, and once again, they seem to be uh, openly heretical. We can recall, for example, um, a definition of the Council of Florence, um, that those not living within the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews and heretics and schismatics, 
cannot become participants in eternal life, but will depart into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels, unless before the end of life the same have been added to the flock. And that statement of the Council of Florence, a, a solemn definition, um, does seem to make very clear that heretics and schismatics are outside the church. And that's precisely what uh, Pope Francis seems to be denying here. So it does seem, uh, certainly on face value, to be heresy. Yes. I was just going to say, I mean, we, we have some of these we have some of these statements. And this is not, like I mentioned at the very beginning, this is not the first sort of statement uh, made by Pope Francis that is troublesome. Is that correct? Absolutely. So we've already seen uh, various things, including his, his uh, well-known document, Amoris Laetitia, um, that motu proprio, in which um, many men of the church saw various heresies. We can mention, for example, the Correctio Filialis that was signed by, by various um, you know, priests and even bishops in the church, including Bishop Follet. Um, and the authors of that document, the Correctio Filialis, identified at least seven heretical propositions in, in Pope Francis's Motu Proprio Amoris Laetitia. Um, so, no, this is not new to the pontificate of Pope Francis. And, and that's one initial observation that I would make is that the most recent statements of his that have shocked some people, um, they're not necessarily that much worse than other things he's already said. So, and, and what we're doing, just, just to kind of give a, a guideline here, we're looking at this statement, we're looking at some of the other statements, we're looking at some other statements uh, from other pontificates as well, and then we're going to kind of try and understand what does this mean. Well, um, so just to kind of give you a, a guideline of, of where we're going with this. Exactly. So I wanted to point out um, what, what Andrew is, is already hinting at, is that um, if we want to be logically consistent with ourselves, you know, now does not seem like the time to say, okay, that's it. Um, we've, we've lost the papacy. Um, because we can even look back at statements that uh, Pope Francis's predecessors have, that have made, which are apparently just as, as heretical as these last ones. Um, even on this, this topic of, you know, membership in the church and, you know, hope of, of eternal salvation, we can mention certain statements by Pope John Paul II, um, in which he seems very clearly to be attributing um, some kind of, you know, participation in Christ, a state of sanctifying grace, hope of eternal life, um, not only to the just or the members of the church, but to all men whatsoever from the first moment of their conception. Um, he is very explicit. So, for example, I, I would quote for you um, his encyclical Redemptor Ominis, in which he says that um, each one is included in the mystery of the redemption. And with each one, with each man, Christ has united himself forever through this mystery. Um, man in all the fullness of the mystery in which he has become a sharer in Jesus Christ, the mystery in which each one of the 4,000 million human beings living on our planet has become a sharer from the moment he is conceived beneath the heart of his mother. And uh, so there, you know, uh, we may well ask, in what way is every person from his conception already a share in Jesus Christ and, and forever? Um, in what way are the damned, for example, sharers in Jesus Christ? It's, it's hard to see how, how that could apply to the damned. And so is, is Pope John Paul II uh, denying the, the, the doctrine that hell exists and, and yes, there are some people in it. Um, so that, that's a problem. Um, and if we're in doubt as well as to his meaning, we find an even more explicit statement in his message to the peoples of Asia, um, which he gave on the 21st of February, the year 1981, in which he said that in the Holy Spirit, each person and all peoples have become, by the cross and the resurrection of Christ, children of God, participants in the divine nature and heirs of eternal life. So he says that of each person and all peoples, um, and when you say participants in the divine nature, you mean in the state of grace, um, because that's always been those two have always been inseparately associated. It's by sanctifying grace that we become partakers of the, of the divine nature. And so effectively, what, what Pope John Paul II seems to be saying there is that everyone, um, everyone who, who, who is alive, who has ever lived, um, is in a state of grace um, and, and will go to heaven. That seems to be the okay. clear implication. Have there been any other popes besides Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis who 
have said things that are that are troubling like this, Father? Well, I think the, the list could go on and on, and, and we won't quote from every single conciliar or post-conciliar pope. Um, we could mention just in passing that Pope Benedict XVI in some of his writings seems pretty clearly to deny our Lord's historical resurrection. Um, for example, he writes in his uh, Principles of Catholic Theology that the resurrection cannot be a historical event in the same sense as the crucifixion is. So there is an ambiguity there, um, but you know, to you and to me, I think uh, an event either is historical or it's not. Um, and so, if you say the resurrection is not historical in the way that the crucifixion is, what I read there is that it's not historical. Period. Um, and I think he, he makes it clear as well in, in certain other statements. Uh, for example, his book Jesus of Nazareth, um, he, he writes that uh, empirical physicality has been transcended by the resurrection. Um, Jesus appears suddenly in the midst of the disciples in a physicality that is no longer subject to the laws of space and time. Now, when you say no okay. longer subject to the laws of space and time, I say, well, outside of history, not real history. Um, so, right. you know, there Pope Benedict XVI, who's regarded as, as, you know, the most conservative and doctrinally sound of all the popes since Vatican II. There he seems quite clearly and, and on more than one occasion to be denying the historicity of our Lord's resurrection. Um, so, so the bottom line here is that I don't think that we can consistently um, or coherently single out Pope Francis alone and say he is the problem. The others, his predecessors, were okay. No, that's not true. So, it, it, what we're doing today, Father, is is looking at this from a from the stance of it seems to be that many people are looking at these statements and saying there's no other option other than. The Pope is a heretic. Um, there is no Pope. We are in a period of sede vacante, meaning the seat is empty. There is no Pope because as soon as the Pope is saying this stuff, it's heretical. He cannot be the Pope anymore. Um, and, and what that does is it does solve a problem. And it solves the problem, meaning it makes it so that we don't have to be scandalized by these very concerning statements from the papacy, whether from John Paul II, Benedict XVI, or Pope Francis. It solves that problem. We don't, we don't have to worry because he's not the real pope and he's not saying that. Exactly. Um, but does it cause any other problems? Well, for sure. Um, so what follows immediately from this, if we apply um, this kind of principle not only to Pope Francis, which is what I might call, jokingly, a kind of micro set of vacantism. So set of vacantism applied you know, to one pope in isolation. But if we apply it on a large scale, um, what I might call macro set of vacantism, um, going all the way back to uh, Paul VI or John the XXIII, um, there are a lot of, of big problems that result from that, which I argue um, would be even, uh, let's say, a greater challenge challenge to face up against than, than simply the problem of, of popes who say heretical things in public. Um, okay. So, you know, we can immediately in infer a number of things, which, which we can go through and prove from certain magisterial texts. Um, but the, the main problems that arise are that um, there seems to be, um, if there hasn't been a pope since John the 23rd, so, uh, sorry, or since Pius the 12th, who died in 1958, then that's uh, 63 years since then that we've had no valid pope. And what would follow would be a, a loss or interruption in what we call apostolic succession. We'll get into that. Um, and this would lead to the total disappearance of the visible hierarchy and the living magisterium. Um, and these things are essential to the constitution of the church that Jesus Christ, our Lord, founded. Um, and, and so there's no question that those consequences are, are inadmissible. As Catholics, we can't, we can't say that. Father, what do you mean by the living magisterium, and why is that so important? <laughs> well, it's it's a term which is very much abused nowadays, but but nevertheless, yeah. in itself, it's a traditional term. Um, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, in fact, in his encyclical on the on the Church Satis Cognitum, wrote that Christ instituted in the Church a living, authoritative, and permanent magisterium. Um, and the word permanent means permanent. It means that at all times, the church will have um, a living magisterium. And by living, we mean that um, the magisterium of the church is not just a, you know, the collection of, of council documents and texts. Um, uh, it's not a, a stack of books, but rather um, the magisterium is as well uh, living men who here and now teach the faith. Um, and so if we say that right now there are no popes, there, there is no pope and there are no bishops who have been uh, legitimately, validly appointed to their sees, 
then we do not have a permanent living magisterium. Okay. We can also mention, of course, um, Pius the, the, the 11th, I'm sorry, uh, in his encyclical Mortalium Animos, says that the teaching authority of the church is daily exercised through the Roman pontiff and the bishops who are in communion with him, um, which emphasizes that, that this is something which is supposed to be without interruption. Okay. So that's the first part of, of the statement that you said earlier. There are three things that are three problems with going into the set of a contest argument or camp or taking this position. Mm -hmm. We have the, the loss of the living magisterium. Um, next, we have the loss of the visible and perpetual succession of, of the papacy. Um, can we go into that a little bit, Father? Absolutely. So, so that's referring back to Pastor Eternus, which is a document of the First Vatican Council. And I just want to read for you a few lines from that, which make clear um, the problem that we're dealing with. So, so Vatican I decreed that it was the will of Christ that in his church there should be shepherds and teachers until the end of time. Um, so that, that would kind of coincide with what we just said about a, a living magisterium. You don't have that without shepherds and teachers, which is to say, um, you know, men who have been legitimately appointed to feed the flock of Christ. Um, and that appointment, as we'll soon see, must come from, from a pope. Um, but then to continue with the council text, in order then that the whole Episcopal office should be one and undivided, and that by the union of the clergy, the whole multitude of believers should be held together in the unity of faith and communion. Our Lord Jesus Christ set blessed Peter over the rest of the apostles and instituted in him the permanent principle of both unities, meaning the unity of faith and communion, and their visible foundation. So Pope Peter and, and then, or sorry, St. Peter and his successors, the popes, are the permanent principle of the church's twofold unity and, and their visible foundation. Um, and there's a canon that follows this. The canon reads, if anyone says that it is not by the institution of Christ the Lord himself, that is to say by divine law, that blessed Peter should have perpetual successors in the primacy over the whole church, or that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter in his primacy, let him be anathema. So immediately we're confronted by, by several problems here. Um, first of all, how is the papacy, the visible foundation of the church's unity, as, as we read in the text just quoted, um, if the papacy can disappear without anyone realizing it? And this would certainly be the case if we, if we bring our set of the contest theory to apply all the way back to John the 23rd. Um, since after all, um, so, so here I'm following um, what the authors of the book said of a contism, a false solution to a real problem, um, priests of our Italian district, they, they wrote, um, they claim that the first public declaration of a set of a contest kind was that of the Mexican Jesuit Joaquin Sainz y Arriaga, um, who in 1973 published a work entitled Sede Vicante. Um, so in other words, from the death of Pius XII uh, in 1958 all the way to 1973, which is a span of 15 years, the entire church publicly adhered to a false head, to John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth. Um, so, so that that seems to be absurd. It, uh, we can no longer call the papacy the visible foundation of the church's unity if the pope can cease to be pope and nobody realizes that's not a visible foundation. Okay. And then the other obvious problem is how can we say that Peter has perpetual successors? If there's been an interregnum of more than 30 years with no validly elected pope, um, that, that's a real problem as well. In history, sure. there have been some um, periods of sede vacante that have lasted, you know, two or maybe three years at the most. Um, and, and that's conceivable. But 63 years, just, just it doesn't um, jive well with the idea of perpetual successors. Right. All right. So that's the, that's the second problem mm -hmm. with um, set of a contism. And the last one that we're going to look at is uh, apostolic su succession. Um, exactly. If there is a set of a conte, there's basically no apostolic succession. Is that true? That's right. Um, and this flows from the, the fact that um, as Pope Pius XII taught in his encyclical Ad Sinarum Gentis, um, the power of jurisdiction uh, which is conferred upon the Supreme Pontiff directly by divine right, flows to the bishops by the same right, but only through the successor of St. Peter. 
So in other words, bishops, um, the bishops who are appointed over dioceses um, are appointed by the Pope and receive their jurisdiction over their diocese from the Pope. And uh, this is the meaning of apostolic succession is that, well, the Pope succeeds to uh, St. Peter in his office of, of the supreme pastor, shepherd of the church. Um, but then the bishops, the residential bishops who, who govern dioceses, succeed to the College of the Apostles. Um, however, they don't succeed um, let's say by by being directly appointed by God, but rather it's through the appointment that the Pope gives them um, that they receive their episcopal jurisdiction over their flock and thus um, pertain to this this ongoing um, reality of of apostolic succession. They succeed to the College of Apostles precisely by being appointed over a diocese um, by by the decree of the Pope. So what happens is if you don't have, um, let's say, one valid pope in a, in a whole succession of popes, uh, you you will still have probably some bishops who received their jurisdiction from the previous pope. And um, so, you know, one one vacancy of the throne of St. Peter um, may not of itself extinguish apostolic succession entirely. But once you have a whole series of anti-popes with no real pope, um, then all of the appointments of new residential bishops are invalid. Those bishops do not receive jurisdiction over their diocese. And so eventually you have no validly appointed residential bishops, no diocesan bishops who actually have true authority or jurisdiction over their flock. And thus the, the entire visible hierarchy of the church is destroyed and apostolic succession is broken. All right. So those are the flaws in the solution to a uh, set of a contism, which, you know, again, at first glance, it seems like a, it seems like a solution. It seems like something that must happen. Um, let's, I guess, take a look back or go back to the beginning of, of this episode, Father, and we're talking about some of these statements. Um, the one just recently from Pope Francis, but then you know other statements. And what we're looking at today essentially is statements that are heretical or seem heretical to you and I, Father, um, what does that mean for the person stating them? Um, yep. Does it basically remove the Pope automatically from office? Does it remove a bishop from office? So these are kind of the questions that we're going to be looking at here in this next section. So um, where do we start with looking at this, Father? Okay, well, uh, great question. So first of all, all I've done so far is is just to point out the absurd consequences of what happens if we take a certain uh, thesis or, or belief. We'll say that the thesis here is that as soon as um, a, a prelate, a leader in the church, bishop or, or the pope himself, as soon as he starts to make uh, heretical statements publicly, then he loses his office without need of any, you know, uh, canonical warnings on the part of his legitimate ecclesiastical superiors, without need need of, of a sentence, um, you know, declaring to the church that he's a heretic, boom, as soon as he's, he's said some publicly heretical things, he loses his op- office ipso facto or automatically. Okay. Um, that's the that's the thesis um, that we're, we're dealing with here. And, and so far, we've just shown that if we apply it in strict rigor to, you know, the last... Um, however many number of popes, we end up with absurd, uh, conclu- absurd consequences. And so this, this is just an initial kind of warning sign that we have to, to say, wait a moment, um, are we really sure of this thesis? And, and now that we have this doubt about it, we're going to go and examine um, the arguments that Sedevacontis usually bring forward in favor of this thesis of automatic or ipso facto loss of office upon publicly preaching or saying heretical things. Um, and we're going to say, first of all, we're going to break down the arguments of Soto Vicontis into two major categories. They argue for this thesis by, by canonical arguments, um, as well as by more strictly theological arguments. And so I think it will be helpful to deal with, with these one at a time. First of all, the canonical ones, then, then getting into the theology itself of what heresy is and what kind of heresy would separate you from the church or make you lose your office. Okay. So the, the first argument then is that uh, just to make sure I have this right, and so I'm I'm following you along, Father. Sure, sure. The first argument is that a a heretic, someone who speaks heresy, is excommunicated automatically as soon as they say this statement. Mm. Uh, is that is that the argument? Yes, exactly. Now, um, in fairness to Sede Vicontis, most of them know that this argument is is not good. It doesn't hold water, but some still do put it out. So I think it's it's worth addressing. 
Okay. Um, so this is, they usually refer to Canon uh, 2314 of the 1917 Code of Canon Law, um, which stipulates, yes, that, that um, as soon as a, a heretic says something heretical publicly, or, or let's say not even publicly, um, this could even be something done privately. You, in, in the secrecy of your bedroom, you write out um, the sentence, you know, Mary is not the mother of God, and, and you actually mean it. You, you understand that you're contradicting a dogma of, of faith, a dogma taught by the church and Fallibly. Um, and as soon as you express your heresy um, externally, whether in speech or writing, you incur, according to canon law, um, an automatic excommunication. And this, at first glance, it would seem to have the implication that, oh, you must be now outside the church, um, because that's the meaning of excommunication, right? Is that is that you're deprived of um, the ability to participate in, in the sacraments and the worship of the church. Um, you're, you're put out of communion. Um, and so some people would point to this this canon and say, well, look, as soon as you become a, a heretic externally in any way, um, that's it. You're no longer part of the church. And so you must also lose your your office or your power of, of jurisdiction of teaching and governing. Um, and so we've got to uh, immediately clarify a few things here. Um, the first is that. Theologians commonly teach that excommunication puts a person outside the body of the church only after he has been denounced by name as someone to be avoided. This is what we call in, in the 1917 code um, of canon law an excommunicatus vitandus, someone who has been excommunicated and, and declared by name. Um, the, there's been a, a statement issued by competent authority saying um, this person is, is a heretic and all must avoid him. Um, or, or even if it's for some other reason. The point being is that um, for an excommunication to actually put you out, outside the church, you have to be indicated by name. And there has to be this command, avoid this person, because he's no longer a member of the church and he'll corrupt you if you associate with him. Um, okay. So not every excommunication puts you outside the body of the church. Um, and this is made abundantly clear as well by Canon 2264, which speaks of acts of jurisdiction that are carried out by an excommunicated person. And this canon says um, that these acts of jurisdiction continue to be valid, even though the person has been excommunicated, for as long as uh, there hasn't yet been a condemnatory or declaratory sentence passed against him. Um, as long as sentence has not been pronounced by competent authority, his acts of jurisdiction continue to be valid. Um, finally, a uh, last point here is that we, we can point out that this argument that we've just given ignores what immediately follows in, in the same canon that it appeals to. So this is canon 2314, um, which deals with the, the, the penalties incurred by heretics and schismatics. And um, immediately, so uh, I'll just read to you the canon, these first two points. So, so this is canon 2314, and it says, All apostates from the Christian faith and each and every heretic or schismatic, number one, incur ipso facto excommunication. That's what we've just discussed. And then number two, if they do not repent after a warning, they are deprived of benefice, dignity, pension, office, or other duty that they have in the church. They're declared infamous, and if they're clerics, then with the warning being repeated, they're deposed. Now, what's important okay. here is that, first of all, you have a warning, a canonical warning, and there's a certain procedure for that. It's delivered by, you know, the person's competent uh, superior. And then if they do not repent after receiving that warning, then they are deprived of office. That's the wording of the canon. And it's clearly the, once again, the competent superior who, who declares that they're deprived of office um, only after having given a canonical warning and that warning has been ignored. Um, so, so to use this, this canon 2314 as an argument at all, um, you'd have to basically just read point number one and ignore everything that follows, because what follows right. is clearly in contradiction with this, this argument that we've just dealt with. Okay. So in order for this, again, just to sum up, in order for this to, to actually happen, mm -hmm. then some, the, the person uttering the heresy must be warned and warned again, and then there's a formal procedure where the person is then removed. It doesn't happen automatically as is claimed at the beginning. That's correct. There has to be, well, certainly at least one warning, and then it's up to the superior to intervene and remove that person from office. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, then there's a second argument that, that is uh, commonly used mm -hmm. by, by the set of accountants, 
Uh, what is that one, Father? Um, yeah, so I'll appeal to Canon 188, um, which says that any office, um, so just to be clear here, clear here, when we're talking about office, we're talking about, let's say, a, a duty or responsibility that someone has in the church, such as, you know, the office of a... Um, of a residential bishop is is his his duty and the authority that he has to to govern uh, the diocese that he's appointed over. That's his office. And so, if you lose office, what that means is that you lose also um, the authority, the the jurisdiction which corresponds to your office. And so, this is why we're concerned about this this idea of loss of office. Um, right. And, and this canon 188 says that any office becomes vacant upon the fact and without any declaration by tacit resignation recognized by the law itself. If a cleric, and, and it lists a number of things that could happen. Number four is if a cleric publicly defects from the Catholic faith, then, as the canon says, his office becomes vacant upon the fact and without any declaration. And so sort of the will point to that and say, well, look, these, these popes, they have already, by their, their publicly heretical statements, they've, they have publicly defected from the Catholic faith, and therefore there's no need of a, of a declaration. They, they automatically lose office without a declaration according to this canon. Okay, seems compelling. <laughs> well, yes, it does at first glance. Um, but we have to, first of all, recognize that um, <laughs> to publicly defect from the Catholic faith does not mean merely to say heretical things publicly. Um, this, this means really to leave the church, um, usually by joining a heretical sect, or at least to renounce the Catholic faith directly as such, um, to say, you know, I, I, I'm no longer Catholic. I no longer believe what the church teaches. Um, and we can find some indications of this. First of all, in the fact that this is a form of, of tacit resignation, as Canon 188 says. Um, and tacit means, you know, silent, not, not being said expressly. Um, tacit resignation implies, though, that there's no longer a will to hold office. That's what it means when you resign. Um, so this is a way of, of resigning from office without explicitly saying that. Um, and someone who expressly renounces the faith of the church does make it clear without necessarily saying so explicitly. Um, he makes it clear to all that he's no longer interested in acting as a representative of the church and teaching in the church's name. And everyone's going to be able to recognize this. I mean, that's why no declaration of loss of office is needed, because the intention to abandon the office is manifest. And this has certainly not been the case with the conciliar popes. Um, Pope Francis still claims to represent the Catholic Church. He still claims to believe the Catholic faith and to teach it, even if many of his utterances do contradict church doctrine. He still does claim to, to represent the church, to teach the Catholic faith, and to believe it himself. He claims that, and so we can't say that he's publicly defected from the Catholic faith. The other, um, the other point here is that we have to interpret Canon 188 in the light of the other canon that we've already mentioned, the one that deals specifically with heretics um, and the process of, of dealing with, with their heresy. Um, and this canon, 2314, is much more explicit about the steps that should be taken. And so we ought to interpret what is ambiguous in, in canon 188 in the light of what is very clear in canon 2314. Um, and if any public heretical statement resulted automatically in loss of office, there would be no need for the canonical warnings that are foreseen in canon 2314, um, the first, first section number two. Um, and it would not be necessary for the competent superior to deprive the heretic after a warning of his office um, if he's already forfeited it automatically. Um, so so that, that just doesn't make sense. We have to reconcile these two canons, and we should interpret the one that has some, some ambiguity in the light of the one which is very clear. Moreover, the same canon, uh, 2314, in, in number three, explicitly mentions canon 188 and gives a kind of interpretation of it. Um, so, so number three of this canon is, if they have given their name to a non-Catholic sect or publicly adhered to it, then they are ipso facto infamous and in accordance with canon 188.4, clerics, if a warning proves fruitless, are to be degraded. Um, so in other words, this, this canon 2314 gives an interpretation to Canon 188, and it says that if the cleric, or if the heretic, has given his name to a non-Catholic sect or publicly adhered to it, then Canon 188 applies. 
But if not, the implication is if not, if he hasn't publicly joined a heretical sect, um, then we have to still go through this whole process of, you know, canonical admonitions. And then and then the competent authority has to remove him from office because it's not clear that he has tacitly resigned. That's not clear at all. So basically, uh, just just to sum up again, we we have to look at both of these. We can't just look at Canon 188 and ignore Canon 2314. That just doesn't work. Exactly. That's right. And I, I think that for those who are listening, following along, um, it will be helpful. I'm sure we'll have the, the text of these canons on, on the screen for them to look at, because um, to be fair, this is legal language. It's very complicated, uh, hard to follow. Um, but but the bottom line is that if you're using Canon 188 um, in such a way that you ignore or cancel out Canon 2314, um, um, which calls for a warning before a person loses office, um, then then you're kind of you're using canon law against itself. That's not a proper way of interpreting canon law. All right. Um, let's move on to another argument of the set of Acontis father, and that is something that was stated by Paul the Fourth, which again seems to be fairly compelling. Mm, right. Um, so so Paul the Fourth. Um, formerly Cardinal Carafa, he was um, a man of great severity and very paranoid about the possibility of um, someone possibly succeeding him as Pope who would be uh, heretical, a Protestant, for example. He was afraid that someone with who was a Protestant or at least with Protestant ideas would become Pope after him. And so he passed this, this bull called uh, Cum Ex Apostolatus, um, in which he declares that anyone who has ever been a heretic is ineligible to be elected Pope. And his election is null, even if all the cardinals agreed upon it. Um, and, and so Sedificantus will throw this out and say, well, look, um, maybe our other canonical arguments aren't good, but, but look at this one. Um, this seems to be very clear. Anyone who's ever been a heretic can't be pope. Um, and so even if we can't prove that, you know, Pope Francis has lost the heresy, uh, sorry, the papacy now for, for his current heresy, um, we can probably prove that he was a heretic even before he was elected. And so his election was, was null. That's another common uh, argument of Um And, I mean, there's a lot of things that we could say about this argument. We could discuss the correct interpretation of the bull, say, what do they mean by heretic? Um, but we don't even have to get into that because, um, canonically speaking, this, this bull, um, as a part of church discipline, has been abrogated by the 1917 Code of Canon Law. Um, and yes, uh, there is a reference to it in the footnotes under Canon 188, what we just discussed, this idea of tacit resignation from office. Um, but, but to be included in the footnotes as a reference does not mean that, that cum ex apostolatus is still um, in force as a, as a part of church discipline. Um, you need more than just to be you know, mentioned in the footnotes. Um, so so this, this legislation, this historical legislation um, has been abrogated. And so on the disciplinary level, it's no longer a valid argument, if it ever was. Um, the only way that this, this um, papal bull could be used is as a theological argument. You could say, well, it teaches something about you know, the incompatibility of, of being a heretic and holding office in the church. Um, and they're fine. Um, but then we'll get into the theological argument. And I would just, just first of all, um, mention that um, if this bull is meant to be used as a theological argument, um, we can look at all the discussion that classic theologians have had about this, uh, this problem of a heretical pope. And to my knowledge, none of them, and I've read a lot, um, none of them has ever invoked this bull of Paul IV, Cum Ex Apostolatus, as a theological argument. It's never been done until, you know, recently by, by present day of a contest. Okay. So this is these are the three canonical arguments that the set of a contest will commonly use or some again we're we're sort of painting with a broad brush here. There's yes. really no way to say, you know, this is what everyone says who, you know, is a set of a contest, etc. But we're just being as general as we can because there are there are many different flavors of set of a as, as you and I have talked about in previous episodes mm. in the crisis series. Sure. Um so then Father, let's dive into the theological side of things. That's the legal side of things. Let's go into the theological side of things. Um, and the most compelling argument in my mind on this, Father, is simply that heresy puts you outside of the church. This is something that has been stated. That's right. So, um, you know, Pius the the twelfth in his encyclical Mystici Corporis on the mystical body of Christ did did state that. Um, so, not every sin 
however grave it may be, is such as of its own nature to sever a man from the body of the church, as does schism or heresy or apostasy. Um, so the teaching of the Pope there is that heresy of its nature severs a man from the body of the church. So yes, that, that statement is, is well backed um, by, by the authority of the magisterium. Heresy does put you outside of the church. Um, and so that would be like the major of, of the syllogism here. The minor premise would be um, no one who's outside of the church can have jurisdiction. Um, and and this is clear enough as well. Um, uh, commonly, the, the one who's quoted here is Leo XIII, who says in Satis Cognitum that it is absurd to imagine that he is, who is outside can command in the church. So you're outside the church, you can't have authority within the church. Um, that, that makes sense. And the conclusion that follows from these two premises is that heretics must lose their jurisdiction um, by the, the, the very fact of becoming heretics. There's nothing further that needs to be done. Um, and this appears to be backed up by a quotation from St. Thomas Aquinas, who says that the power of jurisdiction does not remain in heretics and schismatics. So it seems like upon becoming a heretic, um, you lose your jurisdiction without need for any intervention of, of the church authorities. Okay. Again, seems fairly clear. Um, right. But heresy and the word heretic, the word heresy, the word heretic, those have very specific meanings. So let's dive into that a little bit, Father. How do we understand what this term means? And and are we talking about the same thing? If we talk about someone who says something, again, in, like in the privacy of their own bedroom, like we talked about, or the Pope saying something from a general audience, does that mean he is a capital H heretic or he has pronounced capital H heresy? Right. So great question. And ultimately, the, the whole controversy is going to boil down to this question of, um, you know, what does it take to be a heretic? And uh, also the fact that there are different senses of the word heretic and um, uh, being a heretic in different senses will have different repercussions on your membership in the church and your ability to hold office. So I think we need to break down this, this idea of heresy, first of all, giving a general definition um, and then, and then giving some distinctions, which are, are absolutely necessary to understand the subject matter at hand. Um, first of all, I would give a definition of heresy, which is based on canon law itself. So canon uh, 1325, uh, paragraph two. Heresy is the pertinacious denial or doubting by a baptized person of a truth that must be believed with divine and Catholic faith. When we say divine and Catholic faith, that's referring to the assent that we must give to truths that are directly revealed by God and sufficiently proposed as such by the church, either through a solemn definition or through her ordinary and universal magisterium. So two conditions there. The truth has to be one directly revealed by God, not simply a deduction that you make from a revealed truth, but, but the revealed truth itself. And it has to be sufficiently proposed as a revealed truth by the church. And sufficient proposal means an infallible proposal. Um, so that, that tr truth will be proposed infallibly either in a solemn definition um, or else if it's been taught everywhere, always, and by all, you know, if it belongs to the ordinary and universal magisterium. So that's the first thing is, is we have to be clear. Um, what, is, what is the object of heresy? Um, heresy is not the rejection of a theological opinion, which may happen to be favored at the time, um, or even of a magisterial teaching that has not yet been proposed infallibly. Um, that has not yet been, you know, um, taught universally in, in time um, or, or not yet been uh, the object of, of a solemn definition. Um, the other point, though, in this definition of heresy is, is the idea of pertinacity, um, since heresy is the pertinacious denial or doubting of one of these truths. And pertinacity means here a contempt of the church's magisterium as an infallible rule of faith. It means that you realize this truth has been proposed infallibly by the church uh, as an article of faith, uh, something divinely revealed. And nevertheless, I say no. I, I, I call it into doubt or I deny it. That's pertinacity. All right. Um, there are different kinds of heresy as well. There's what's called material heresy and formal heresy. What are the distinctions there, Father? Right. So that's based upon whether there is pertinacity or not, because it's possible to deny a truth of faith without realizing it. And then you're a material heretic. Um, whereas formal heresy is when you deny the truth of the faith and you know that you're doing it. Um, 
But then this is subject to a further subdivision because um, we can speak of this pertinacity or formal heresy um, insofar as it's, it's known in the internal forum. Um, meaning, you know, in the conscious uh, the conscience of the person himself who's a heretic, um, and and insofar as his conscience is manifested um, in the tribunal of confession. Um, now, the church, her governing authority, her hierarchy, does not judge the internal matters of the soul. Um, it's only the confessor, the um, the minister of the sacrament of confession, who, upon hearing confession, judges if you know this soul um, is guilty of formal heresy or not. Um, but the church doesn't enter into the internal form in her, you know, in her regular governing of the church. Um, then there's person pertinacity when it's brought to the external forum. Um, that is to say, you know, the, um, the governing of, of the church, um, in what we can see and observe of, of people's actions and their words and so on. Um, and this kind of person pertinacity in the external form is manifested, especially by, um, being stubborn or obstinate in the face of canonical warnings. Um, and it's this, this pertinacity manifested in this way, in the external form, um, which is the last disposition on the part of the heretic that is required um, for the church to be able to rightly deprive him of, of office and cut him off from her juridical structure by a declaratory or condemnatory sentence. Um, that's anticipating a little bit, though, our, our conclusion that we're going to argue for. The um, okay. I'll just sorry, just jump ahead. Then uh, the last uh, division of heresy and the most relevant one here in this this question of jurisdiction, loss of office, is the division of heresy into occult or manifest. And heresy is divided this way depending on whether um, the fact of heresy, that is the the existence of, of a heretical statement, um, and the pertinacity of the heretic, his obstinacy, his ill will, whether these things have been sufficiently established in the external forum. Um, if they have not yet been sufficiently established, then the heresy is occult. But if they have, it's it's manifest. And we have a little bit of, of help here from canon law. Canon law specifies that a crime is considered to be materially occult or hidden if the delict, meaning the, the bad deed itself, is hidden. But it's formally occult if imputability is not known. In other words, um, if I say, let's, let's say I, I say in public, Mary is not the mother of God, um, then certainly the delict, the bad statement itself is, is public. It's well known. Um, particularly if it's broadcasted by the media or something. Um, but it, it may still remain, um, the, the crime itself of heresy may still remain formally occult um, if it's not clear to people that, that I'm actually guilty of rejecting the church's teaching authority. Because maybe um, I'm a catechumen or I was never properly instructed in the faith. Um, Sorry, catechumen, uh, let's forget that example, because you have to be baptized to to be a heretic. Um, sure. but, but let's say I've never been properly formed in the faith, and so I don't realize that I'm contradicting church teaching. Um, then, then, in fact, I don't have that, that formal um, heresy, or I don't have pertinacity. Um, and so it's possible for the fact of a heretical statement to be well known, um, that's, that's public or even manifest, um, but the, the culpability, the imputability of the crime may still be hidden. And much of the controversy um, that we have with Sede Vicontis surrounds um, this question of what conditions are required for the crime of heresy to be manifest, not only materially as to the fact itself of an objectively heretical statement, but formally as to its imputability in the external form. Okay. So, so bottom line, we don't, if, if someone is saying that in the public sphere, that Mary is not the mother of God, we, we don't, we, we may not know specifically that their intention, what their intention is by, by saying that, that we may not know whether or not they're, they have this uh, hatred for the magisterium of the church, just to put it in, in simpler terms. Sure. I mean, and, and with the, that example, it's pretty hard to think of a way that they could be ignorant of the fact that this is, this is official church teaching. Um, sure. It probably would have been better to choose something else, which is not as, as obvious. Um, but it is possible that someone could deny um, a, a dogma of the church without realizing that it's actually a dogma. They could think that it's just a theological opinion. Um, they could be completely unaware of the fact that the church has definitively taught this thing that they're denying. And that would be uh, material heresy. 
All right. So we've looked at material and formal heresy. We've looked at occult and manifest heresy. Uh, if someone were to be one of these um, types of heretics, um, what effect does that have on any sort of membership that they may have in the Catholic Church? Yes, good question. Well, um, what theologians normally talk about here is is the distinction between occult or secret heretics and then manifest ones, um, which is what we were just discussing. Um and while it's true that occult heresy does put you outside of the church in some sense, um, you know, we, we gather that from the words of Pius IX in his bull, Inifabilis Deus, when he's defining the Immaculate Conception. He says, if anyone dares to think otherwise than has been defined by us, let him know and understand that he's, he's condemned by his own judgment. He has sh- suffered shipwreck in the faith and that he is separated from the unity of the church. Um, so that's even if you just think something contrary to what you know has been defined by the church, you are in some sense separated from the unity of the church. But theologians will immediately add that this separation is not understood to be a juridical or canonical separation from the church. And here I can just quote St. Robert Bellarmine himself, who, who, as many of you know, is um, probably the, the favorite theologian of Sede Um St. Robert Bellarmine says, it is certain, whatever one or another may think, that an occult heretic, if he be a bishop or even the supreme pontiff, does not lose his jurisdiction or dignity or the title of head in the church until either he publicly separates himself from the church or, being convicted of heresy, is unwillingly separated. Um, that's from his, his work on the Church Militant, Book 3, Chapter 10. Um, so it's clear from that that quotation, as well as we could cite many theologians, um, that being a secret or a cult heretic is not sufficient for you to separate yourself from the church in terms of her juridical structure, the whole, um, you know, the, the visible hierarchy of the church. Um, so, so if a bishop or even the pope himself internally or secretly disbelieves truths of faith, um, he still remains a member of the church juridically and is still capable of, of holding office and exercising acts of jurisdiction. Okay. That's a cult heretic. What about someone who's a manifest heretic? What does that do? Right. Well, here we have to distinguish different senses of the word manifest heretic. And the whole controversy, in fact, um, centers around whether we should understand someone to be a manifest heretic um, as soon as he publicly makes heretical statements, um, especially if it's in a way that leads good Catholics to vehemently suspect that that the person is is malicious, that he's pertinacious, um, even if no canonical warnings have been given. Um, or should we understand manifest heresy in a more restricted sense? Um, that is to say that the um, the canonical warnings have been given, and even a sentence has been issued by the authority of the church declaring the person a heretic. Then there's no question that 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 man is a manifest heretic once once sentence has been given by, by proper authority. Um, and all theologians would certainly concede at that point that the man is outside of the church juridically, that he is no longer capable of holding office. But the whole point of contention here is whether a man, before a sentence has been given by the church, before even canonical warnings have been given, can he be considered a manifest heretic simply because um, his own conduct, his statements in public, um, bring about this suspicion in the minds of people? And, um, well, uh, to return to St. Robert Bellarmine, this, this does appear to be his position. Um, he says, for example, in his, in his work on the, the Roman pontiff, he says that a manifest heretic would be ipso facto deposed, um, would automatically lose his office before any excommunication or sentence of a judge. And so he seems to be taking the word manifest heretic um, in, in the sense that... Um, you know, he, he's made publicly heretical statements. There doesn't seem to be any way of excusing him. It's a kind of notoriety of, of fact as opposed to um, notoriety of law, um, which is which is when something has been declared by competent authority. Um, this is without a declaration of competent authority. It's just, you know, um, you and I looking at the man, it seems obvious to us that he's a heretic from what he said. And St. Robert Bellarmine seems to be saying um, that that's enough for him to be separated from the church and lose his office. And we can find, you know, the same thing repeated um, in, by many other theologians, some of them even canonized saints, St. Saint Alphonsus de Liguori, St. Francis de Sales. Um, 
I would point also to the Catholic Encyclopedia, um, which summarizes this position by saying, were a pope to become a public heretic, that is, if he were publicly and officially to teach some doctrine clearly opposed to what has been defied as de fide catholica, um, so of Catholic faith, many theologians hold that no formal sentence of deposition would be required, as by becoming a public heretic, the Pope would, ipso facto, cease to be Pope. So in other words, okay. this, this is a position which has been held not only by St. Robert Bellarmine, but by many, many theologians. Um, but at the same time, we can note from this article of, of the Catholic Encyclopedia, so published in 1913, um, we can note that it, it, it was, and it continues to be, a, an issue which is debated by theologians. Um, is it true that the Pope would lose his office automatically without a sentence of deposition? Um, the, the encyclopedia says many theologians hold that, but what is implied is that others do not. Others don't, and, right. and so that's precisely what we have to look into, um, especially since if you say yes, he, he does lose his office before a sentence of deposition is given, um, then we have this doubt. Well, what about all these popes that have said publicly heretical things? Um, have they lost their, their dignity? Um, and, and so so we already noted that, that certain uh, uh, theologians of great authority have, have said yes. But on the other side of this, um, we find other very, very important, very influential theologians. Um, we can cite, among many others, Cajetan, John of St. Thomas, uh, Bilois, who, who are all um, you know, famous commentators of St. Thomas. They, are, they belong to the school of Thomas, those who strictly follow the, the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and all of these authors and, and others like them hold that a sentence of the church would be required um, for the crime of heresy to be canonically manifest and to separate a man from the church. And this would be true not only of the Pope, but, but with even greater reason um, of bishops and priests who, who say heretical things. So this is just, the yeah. Go ahead. This is the big separation. This is kind of the in my mind. Correct me if I'm wrong, Father. Mm -hmm. But this seems mm -hmm. to be kind of where the rubber meets the road on the set of a contest argument. You have uh, Saint Saint Robert Bellarmine. You have Saint Alphonsus. Saint Francis de Sales saying one thing, and then you have others saying another. Um, exactly. Are we? And maybe we'll get into this and tell me just to hold on if I'm asking a question ahead of time. But it seems like we're picking and choosing the position that we want um mm -hmm. or am, am i well am I, do you see what i'm saying sure uh, absolutely so uh in all fairness to the side of the contest um their their theory um in principle is supported by a, a good number of theologians um what i don't think any theologian would support is the conclusions that they draw from it um and that's why we we dealt with that already earlier on in, in the podcast um so in other words either of these two opinions um if you just looked at the number of theologians on each side the, the weight of authority either of them could be could be chosen freely by a catholic um because it is it is a matter of controversy that has not been decided in a de definitive way by any magisterial pronouncement um and so um my aim here is simply to point out first of all um the the theological opinion that the set of the contests prefer um it doesn't seem like we can hold it in practice at least in the way that they do by applying it to all these popes knocking them down saying that they are um you know they're anti-popes they they lost the papacy they lost their church membership for manifest heresy um, we certainly cannot apply this this um, this opinion, this theological opinion, in the way that they do. That is clear. Um, and so we're going to discuss. You know, um, should we reject it altogether? Is there a way of understanding it which is more acceptable? Um, and what arguments are there um, for the other side? What about the theologians who say you need a sentence of the church first? Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think we'll have to look at that seriously, um, and I'm going to argue in in some of what follows um, that that their opinion um, does seem to be more probable um, and seems to have its basis in even some of the the writings of Saint Thomas Aquinas, um, some things that haven't really been brought very much in, into the discussion until now. Um, but but it's enough for us to say, um, you know, th our opinion that the that the Pope does not lose his office before um, a declaration um, is supported by by many theologians with with great authority. Um, it has good reasons behind it, and um, you know, 
uh, to answer in advance the objection that follows on that, well, um, set of consensus will say your opinion is no good. It's not acceptable because um, it, it it involves some kind of conciliarism or Gallicanism. How can the church pass a sentence on the Pope? And right. that's that was the opinion of these authors. Um, and so to be very clear, um, we, the Society of St. Pius X, if we uh, tend to follow this opinion, um, it's not necessarily embracing um, that further statement that, yes, the Church can pass a sentence um, upon the Pope and declare him a, a heretic in such a way that he loses his office. Um, not necessarily. Um, but the point is that um, for for the crime of heresy to be canonically manifest, there must be a sentence. And so if in the case of the Pope, no sentence is possible um, because the highest see is judged by no one, um, then what, what follows is that um, the heresy of the Pope remains always canonically occult or hidden. Um, it's impossible. There is no process, no legitimate legal process that can bring sufficiently um, to light his his pertinacity in the external form. Because if he's given canonical admonitions, um, there's no one with authority to do that, and he has no obligation to respond. Um, so we're always left with this doubt. Well, um, is is he really a heretic or not? And in the absence of authoritative, you know, warnings or admonitions, his heresy remains canonically hidden, occult. Okay. So there's there's no one to judge the Pope. He is he is right. the supreme pontiff. So there is, there is no mechanism in the church by which he can be judged. Not even by a council. Not by bishops. Not by Dubia. Not by Father McGilvery. <laughs> well, um, yes, it would seem it would seem not. Now, these these authors that uh, we're going to be quoting, um, who who established the necessity of a declaratory sentence for heresy to be manifest, these authors um, they hold that it is possible for the church to pass a sentence um, on the pope for heresy, and they have their own ways of explaining how this is not in conflict with the doctrine of 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 the pope's primacy, because in fact all of these authors, Cajetan, John of St. Thomas and the rest, they accept the primacy of the Pope. Um, uh, but they'll point to, for example, certain ancient uh, canons, um, such as there's a canon in, in medieval canon law called C. Papa, which talks about how if, if the Pope becomes a heretic, um, then in that one case, he can be judged by the church. Um, so, so there are some, you know, juridical precedents for this opinion. Um, and the opinion, I would add further, has not been condemned. Um, it has not been abandoned by theologians, even after the, the definition of papal primacy given at Vatican I. Um, just to cite one author of, of great authority, Father Prumer, Father Dominic Prumer, who is a great moral theologian of the 20th century um, and who wrote a book on, on canon law. Um, in his in his manual of canon law, he says that um, you know in the case of a of a publicly heretical pope, um, different opinions have been brought forth as to how he would lose his his office, how he would cease to be pope for heresy. Um, and Prumer cites both Bellarmine, whose opinion we're going to discuss, and 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 then also Cajetan, who's representing this other opinion that you need a, a sentence and that a sentence could be passed on the pope. And Prumer continues by saying that uh, in in fact, none of these opinions surpass the limits of probability. In other words, it's none of these is, is certain, um, and and they still are you know valid opinions. Um, if the opinion of Cajetan were contrary to the definitions of Vatican I, were, were a denial of papal primacy, if that were clear, um, then Prumer, who's writing well after Vatican I, could not give any probability to that opinion. But the fact is that he and other authors as well have continued to uphold that this is this is an acceptable opinion. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia that I quoted for you, its article on infallibility, which which touches on this matter tangentially, uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia says many authors think that um, the Pope would lose his, his office ipso facto before a sentence of, of deposition. Um, but the implication is that there are others, even well after Vatican I, who still continue to say, nope, uh, a sentence of deposition is necessary, and even, even they, they hold that it's possible. For us, we don't necessarily hold that it's possible, because it's not clear how to reconcile it with Vatican I. Um, but what's important is that, um, so, so what's fundamental to the, the argument of Cajetan, John of St. Thomas, and the other people that, that will quote, is that without a sentence um, declaring the crime, the crime remains 
canonically occult, canonically hidden. And so um, that means that um, if a sentence is possible, if it's possible for the church, let's say an, ecum- an imperfect ecumenical council, a council of bishops who come together in opposition to the Pope, if it's possible for them um, to give a sentence, um, to pass a sentence of heresy on the Pope, to, to declare him a heretic, um, then he loses office, fine. But if that is impossible, if their sentence would be without any authority, without any effect, then what, what, uh, what results is that the Pope remains the Pope. And he does not lose his office for making these these heretical statements. So that all makes sense, what you're saying. But I am a bit concerned because it seems like we are we're taking the opinion of some theologians who are very learned, follow St. Thomas Aquinas, etc. But we are dismissing St. Robert Bellarmine. St. Robert Bellarmine is a doctor of the church. He's a canonized saint. His, his opinions... Father, have to take some weight. So I'm going to push back on you a little bit. How do you how do you just dismiss an argument that seems very well founded from Saint Robert Bellarmine? Uh, great question, and this is something that you know Sotavicontus will often object to us. Precisely this, um, you know, Cajetan, John of Saint Thomas, Bor, um, you know, Dominic Banyas, and and others, other theologians that you quote. They're not saints. They're not doctors of the church. We have to go on the side of the saints and doctors of the church. Um, but I'm going to point out, first of all, um, this is not true. We can't say that just because someone is a saint or even a doctor of the church, that all of their teachings must be accepted and followed by us as, as good Catholics. Um, a very easy example to give of this would be um, St. Anselm, who, who is a doctor of the church. And he has an argument for the existence of God called the ontological argument in which basically he says, you know, God is the most perfect being that we could imagine or conceive of, um, but is more perfect to exist than not to exist. Therefore, God must exist. Uh, it's like a shortcut to proving the existence of God. And he proposed this. He was very serious about it. He, he thought, you know, how can I prove to unbelievers the existence of God? And this is what he came up with. And he is a canonized saint. He's a doctor of the church. And nevertheless, Hardly anyone, hardly any Catholic theologian takes this argument seriously. And St. Thomas Aquinas himself, um, without mentioning St. Anselm by name, he, he takes care to refute this argument to show that it's invalid. Um, he does that in his, his own Summa Theologica, um, uh, where he treats of the existence of God. So in other words, it is possible for a saint and doctor of the church to propose an argument or establish a thesis which is which is false, which is invalid. Um and so, no, be, be, being a canonized saint or a doctor of the church does not make one infallible, does not mean that, that Catholics are obliged to accept each and every one of that person's theses. Um, regarding St. Robert Bellarmine himself, it may be helpful to point out that um, he, he does have some other theses um, which are commonly rejected, or at least which are very controversial. Um, regarding the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, for example, St. Robert Bellarmine taught uh, what's called destruction theory, um, in which, well, uh, basically he holds that the priest's communion is an essential part of the sacrifice of the Mass because it's by the priest's communion that the victim is destroyed, and the destruction of the of the victim is, is an essential part of sacrifice. Um, and well, this this theory that the priest communion is is the act by which the victim is destroyed. It's it's by and large rejected um, by theologians. In fact, it seems even to be implicitly rejected by Pope Pius the Twelfth himself um, in his encyclical Mediator Dei, where he teaches that the essence of the sacrifice of the Mass consists in the double consecration alone. That the separate consecration of the of, of the bread into the body of Christ and the and the uh, the the wine into the blood of Christ um, is already a mystical immolation or mystical destruction of the victim, and that the priest's communion is not essential. Um, it is an, an integral part of the sacrifice. It's required for its wholeness, but it's not part of its essence. Um, Forgive me if that's a little bit abstruse, but um, this is to point out that there are other theories of, of St. Robert Bellarmine that um, were wrong and, and have been rejected by the church. Um, 
We can point as well to certain others, um, his adduction theory as to how the, the Blessed Sacrament, how our Lord Jesus Christ comes to be really present under the sacramental species. Um, it's it's opposed by the, the Thomists who favor instead the production or the reproduction theory. Um, and their, their opinion is more commonly accepted in the church. It's more in harmony with the teachings of the Council of Trent. Um, St. Robert Bellarmine also has a, a theory on how to reconcile grace and free will called congruism, um, which is a variant of, of Molinism. Um, and, and so all these theories of his um, either have been you know, rejected or at least they're not, uh, they're not commonly embraced by, by Catholic theologians, which is just to, to highlight, to underscore the fact that just because he's a saint and doctor of the church doesn't mean he's always right. Okay, so then how do we... How do we reconcile um, some of these statements? I mean, it, it seems like uh, we're casting some doubt on almost all the pronouncements of, of the saints um, by saying that some <laughs> of them can be wrong. Um, well, I mean, I'm not calling all of his uh, statements doubtful. In fact, if he was canonized and declared a doctor of the church, that was for a reason. It's because as a whole, his doctrine is excellent. It's very good. Um, but it's just the truth that nobody gets it right all the time. Um, and so it's not wrong. It's not, um, you know, irreverent or intellectually prideful to express disagreement with, with uh, a saint or doctor of the church on a particular point, especially if you can, you can find theologians of great weight who, who agree with you in opposing him. And that's, in fact, the case here, um, because if we look at the divide in theologians as to this question of manifest heresy, um, we find that it's practically all the Thomists, those who are strict followers of St. Thomas Aquinas, are on the side of, well, Cajetan and, and John of St. Thomas, these, these great Thomists, who they all hold, these followers of St. Thomas Aquinas all hold that you need a sentence of the church before a, you know, quote unquote, manifest heretic loses office. Um, and, and on this topic, I would point out, well, um, St. Pius X, in his Motu Proprio, Doctoris Angelici, when he's talking about, you know, the importance of following St. Thomas Aquinas as our guide in, in all matters theological, um, as well as philosophical, he says um, this very important statement. He says, if the doctrine of any writer or saint has ever been approved by us or our predecessors, it may easily be understood that it was commended to the extent that it agreed with the principles of Aquinas, or was in no way opposed to them. In other words, the status of St. Thomas Aquinas as, as universal doctor of the church is so high, so exalted, um, that even if you know, the popes have recommended, for example, St. Alphonsus de Liguori as a, a, a safe guide in, in areas of moral theology, or St. Robert Bellarmine has been you know, recommended especially for um, these, these questions concerning the church um, and, and the primacy of the Roman pontiff and so on. Even if the church has recommended certain other men, um, according to St. Pius X, this recommendation is only to the extent that their teaching is, is in agreement with the, uh, with the principles of St. Thomas Aquinas, or at least doesn't oppose them. So St. Thomas holds a, a, a priority over all the other doctors of the church. Um, and that's why when you see all the Thomists, all those who follow St. Thomas more closely than any other theologians, when all the Thomists follow one line of opinion in opposition to maybe St. Robert Bellarmine, maybe St. Alphonsus de Liguori or whoever, um, just the fact that the Thomists are saying what they're saying is already a strong argument of authority. Okay. So there can be disagreements with a saint and a doctor of the church. St. Thomas Aquinas holds the primacy. Got it. Right. So let's look specifically at the arguments of St. Robert Bellarmine, Father. Um, Excellent. What's wrong with them? Okay. Well, um, let's let's dive right in. So, um, Saint Robert Bellarmine he argues for this idea that a manifest heretic loses his his office, his authority in the church immediately um, upon making publicly heretical statements. Um, he argues it for it in two places. One is where he deals with the the ideas of a cult and manifest heresy in his treatise on the church militant. Another is where he talks about the case of the heretical Pope and his treatise on, on the Roman pontiff. Um, and if we collate these two, you know, um, uh, passages in St. Saint Robert Bellarmine, we bring them together. We see that in both cases, he uses the same example to prove his point. He, he points to the example of the heretical patriarch of Constantinople, Nestorius, who preached publicly the heresy that Mary was not the mother of God. 
um, and that our Lord Jesus Christ was a, a human person um, in whom the word of God dwelled as in a temple. So, so Mary giving birth to him was, was not the mother of God, just the mother of this human person. Um, that was what we called an Nestorian heresy. And the stories began to preach these things publicly um, in in his uh, you know cathedral of, of Constantinople, um, and well, um, Saint Robert Bellarmine argues that as soon as he began to preach those things, he lost his jurisdiction, his power in the church. Um, he became a manifest heretic right away, um, even before he was condemned by the Council of Ephesus. You know, two two or so years later. Um, and his entire basis for saying this is um, from certain decisions of Pope St. Celestine, who was the Pope at the time. And um, when Pope St. Celestine heard uh, of what was going on, um, he, he heard that Nestorius had been excommunicating um, all of his clergy who were opposing him, opposing his heresy, um, that he was you know, punishing them all and trying to force his heresy upon the Church of Constantinople. And Pope St. Celestine wrote um, to console these, these clerics, these, these clergymen who had been excommunicated by their patriarch Nestorius. He wrote to them. Um, saying, you know, not to take any account of these excommunications, because from the moment that this man um, began to preach this heresy, he was no longer capable of throwing anyone out of the church, um, since he had already shown himself worthy to be deposed. Um, that, that's, those are basically the words of Pope St. Celestine. And St. Robert Bellarmine, looking at this example, he says, ah, um, uh, the Pope is saying that Nestorius was unable to validly excommunicate anyone ever since he started to preach his heresy in public. Therefore, he must not have had his jurisdiction as, as patriarch. He must have lost it at the moment that he began preaching. And if we want to directly respond to this ex historical example, we can say, well, it actually doesn't hold water. Um, it's not the only possible explanation for why these excommunications were, were declared to be null. Um, well, the obvious reason, in fact, is that um, they were manifestly unjust. These, these clerics who were excommunicated by Nestorius, what were they doing? They were opposing his heresy. And if you ask any canonist, um, and they'll, they'll say, of course, an excommunication which is manifestly unjust has no effect. Um, it is null in itself. And so that's sufficient to, to explain this, this reply of Pope St. Celestine. You don't have to say that the man has lost his office, that he's lost his jurisdiction. You can just say that these acts of, of excommunication or other censures that he inflicted on his clergymen, um, these acts themselves were null. They were lacking in authority because of their injustice. And that's enough. You don't have to say that the man himself lost his authority as such. Um, and in fact, if we look at the historical records, we look at the correspondence between all the men involved in this, this great historical drama, we look at the acts of the Council of, of Ephesus, um, it seems very clear that Nestorius was considered to hold his office all the way up until the time that he was deposed by a sentence of the Council in the year 431. Um, you read through the Acts, and maybe we can, in fact, post some of these um, uh, the, the texts which are relevant to this question. We can post them um, online. But um, it, it actually appears very clear that Nestorius continued to be recognized as, as patriarch, as having authority until the council deprived him of, of his authority by an official sentence, declaring him a heretic and putting him outside of the church. Interesting. Okay. So... But did, did Robert Bellarmine, St. Robert Bellarmine, did he, I don't want to say contradict himself, but did, did he give any other examples that are that seem to indicate he's kind of holding both, both positions or both sides? Well, yes, exactly. You lead me right into the next point, which is that, um, in fact, not only does his one example that he gives not really hold water, it's not, it's not, um, <laughs> it's not watertight, um, but he also has other uh, passages in his writings that seem to contradict this position or, or make it less, less plausible. Um, in particular, I would note that when he writes on the notes of the church, um, he brings forth example of um, certain churches, specifically the churches of Corinth and Galatia, who publicly taught heresies. And we, we read this, in fact, in the, epistle, in the epistles of St. Paul to the Corinthians and, and to the Galatians. Uh, the Corinthians denied the resurrection of the body, and the Galatians taught that the observance of the Mosaic law is necessary for salvation. 
And St. Paul had to write to these churches and rebuke them and say, what you're teaching is, is heresy. It's not, it's not what I have given you. Um, and in fact, if anyone preaches to you a gospel other than that which I have given, let him be anathema. Um, so, so these churches were teaching heresy publicly. Um, and nevertheless, St. Robert Bellarmine writes that they were still true churches. They were not, in other words, separated from the unity of the Catholic Church. And he gives the reason. He says, it is one thing to err and to be ready to receive instruction. And, and that's how these churches were. When they were corrected by St. Paul, presumably they, they amended their ways. They, they changed their teaching. But it is another thing not to want to learn. And so there, St. Robert Bellarmine himself introduces this idea of, um, well, uh, formal versus material heresy. Is it just that the person is in ignorance when he says heretical things publicly, or is he actually uh, malicious? And, and this is precisely the problem. How can we tell if someone is, in the words of St. Robert Bellarmine, ready to receive instruction unless he is admonished by his legitimate superior? That's the problem. Um, very interesting. So, so basically, again, we can't going back to occult versus manifest heresy. Uh, we we cannot determine whether or not someone is is speaking this. You know, what what is the intention behind their their heresy? And unless we can do that, right? Mark. Exactly. And and I mean, some some um, set of economists will say, well, you know, if the person was is well educated, you know, it's a He's a bishop or, or the pope. He should be. He should know the church's faith better than anyone else. So how can we co possibly give him any leeway or say, well, maybe he's he's in good faith? Right. Um, but that's simply that's not the um, that's not the procedure of the church, especially in our canon law. It doesn't say you know if if the cleric if if the heretic is ignorant, then he should be given a canonical warning. But you know if you think that there's no way he he is in good faith, then just go ahead and and uh, you know deprive him of office right away. There aren't these distinctions built into canon law. It doesn't matter what the person's level of education was. Um, always. You, you proceed um, with, with what's stipulated by canon law. You give the canonical admonitions to prove, to test um, pertinacity in the external forum. Um, so this is, I guess, let's, let's keep going on, on this line of questioning, Father. Mm -hmm. Again, what is, if, if someone is malicious or ignorant in, in their preaching on, on this heresy, um, how, do we, how are we supposed to think of that person? Well, um, the, the truth is that we can't really judge um, which of the two they are. It's not easy to. Um, so, in fact, I think this is, this is pointing to um, the practical problems that are inherent in this thesis of, of St. Robert Bellarmine, um, which is that, you know, if it's sufficient for a person to say heretical things publicly, um, for him to lose his office in the church, um, then there's going to be a lot of anxiety of conscience, you know, especially when there are priests or bishops or there's a pope um, who says things that border on heresy. But it's not 100 percent clear that, in fact, uh, this is a, a heresy. It could just be opposed to, you know, the common opinion of theologians or or something that's been taught with authority, but not yet infallibly. There's all these different degrees of, of magisterial teaching and not everything is is a truth of faith. Um Moreover, it's, it's so hard to speculate about what the person actually knows, whether they're aware of, of um, the fact that they're, they're contradicting church doctrine, um, whether they're ready to be corrected by, by their legitimate superior. Um, and so if we follow this, this thesis to the letter, it, it fosters all kinds of anxieties, um, and it, it can even create schisms. Um, and we may see that later on when we deal with Sedevacantism in history. Um, on this line, I would like to quote um, one of the most important theologians in this controversy, uh, Charles René Bilois. Um, the, he was a, a theologian who wrote in the um, the early part of the 18th century. Um, he, he wrote a commentary on the, the works of St. Thomas Aquinas, um, his Summa, and his commentary was extremely influential. It was very widely used by the clergy. And he writes on this particular subject, and he takes the position of Cajetan and John and St. Thomas that you need, um, you need a statement of the church before a, a heretic loses office for what he said publicly. Um, and he argues this way. I'll quote from him. He says, If manifest heretics had to be avoided before their denunciation, this would endanger souls and generate anxiety of conscience, since there would be uncertainty as to who are manifest heretics. 
some persons affirming and others denying, as actually happened in the case of Jansenism. It is very difficult for lay people to know with certainty if someone is a manifest heretic or not, since in most cases the subject matter of the heresy surpasses their understanding. So these are the kinds of practical difficulties that this idea um, uh, results in, um, even just for, you know, if it's a question of your, your local parish priest who you suspect of heresy, um, then you have this anxiety of conscience. Well, you know, he hasn't yet, no, no sentence has been passed by against him. His bishop hasn't deposed him. Um, he's still the parish priest and, and goes and preaches and hears confessions. Can I go to him for a confession or not? Has he lost his jurisdiction and his membership in the church because of the heretical things that he's, he said? Um, and so, in it, uh, you know, in many times in church history, this if this were true, th there would have been a lot of confusion and, and anxiety. But even more so when it's applied to the Pope. And many theologians have pointed out this difficulty, which I think has been largely ignored by the partisans of, of St. Robert Bellarmine's position. In fact, in all the, the writings that I have read so far, I've never come across a direct response to this difficulty, one that actually takes away the, the problem that this um, thesis implies in practice. Um, so to quote, for example, Francisco Suarez, who's actually a, a Jesuit who is contemporary with St. Robert Bellarmine, um, and also very influential in, in the Jesuit order. They, they tend to follow his, theo his theological writings more than anyone else's. And he says, we would fall into doubt about exactly how great the degree of infamy ought to be for the Pope to be reputed to have fallen from his dignity. Thence would arise schisms. And everything would become perplexing, especially if the Pope, after becoming infamous, would keep possession of his see by force or other means and exercise many acts of his office. You know, would these acts be valid? Um, do we have to pay heed to them or not? Um, there would be all these disagreements in the church. Is the Pope's heresy manifest enough for him to have lost office or not? And some would say yes, and others would say no. And just to quote one more theologian on the same line, um, Dominic Banyas, who was uh, a great Thomist and actually was one of the spiritual directors of St. Teresa of Avila. Um, he was of the same opinion. He, he required a declaration of the church, a sentence of the church. And he said that, you know, if this sentence of the church were not required for loss of office, um, then in particular with regard to the papacy, we would have doubtful popes and unknown popes. And everything would be churned up in a kind of Babylonic conf confusion. Uh, that's what he writes. Um, and that's what not only he, but so many theologians have pointed out. And, and I don't think that there's ever been a coherent response given to that problem. So, so the uh, again, it's, it's looking at the practical difficulties with accepting this, this conclusion that someone can lose their office immediately after becoming a heretic. Um, and, if, and if you agree with that, and again, it's a disputed, it's a disputed spot in in theology. But if you hold to that, you're going to open up a whole can of worms in terms of how did the faithful see a possible heretic pastor? How did the faithful see a possible heretic pope? It's just going to cause mass confusion and essentially rip the church apart. Precisely. So the theory is extremely simple and and compelling um, on the abstract level, on on, on the speculative level. Um, it seems very simple. It seems to work well. It also explains, you know, it does away with the difficulty of how could the church pass a sentence on the pope for heresy. It, it seems to um, it has a lot that is attractive in it, but when you apply it in practice, it's it's a disaster. Um, and that's precisely what we've been seeing in the last 50 years with, with all of these um, various set of Acontis sects that have broken off and at, at various times and for various reasons and fight among themselves and, and so on. Um, this is a, a you know living demonstration of the practical difficulties inherent in this theological opinion. Um, but I think uh, what's probably the most compelling counter-argument to Bellarmine's opinion is that um, you know, in fact, it's testable uh, in a way because we can look at the practice of the church and say, well, um, does the church behave this way? Does the church, do the faithful act as if, um, you know, a man could lose his authority at any moment by making a heretical statement? Or is it the practice of the church to wait and to do, do make canonical admonitions and so on? Um, and, and to go back and, and quote once again from uh, the theologian Charles-René Biouard, 
um, who we've cited before, um, he provides us a very valuable testimony as to what was the practice of the church in his era. Once again, that's that's the the earlier mid 18th century, um, and that's that's coming about one century after Saint Robert Bellarmine, who, who died, I believe, in the in the early 1600s, early 17th century. Um, so this is this is more than 100 years after Bellarmine, and so you'd think that by now, you know, these ideas have been. Arid, there's been a lot of controversy. Surely the church would have come to some kind of at least a practical resolution as to how to deal with this issue. And I think that uh, Bielwar gives us a very important testimony as to how the church in practice works. Um, and what what thesis, what what theory is, is the one which is actually followed in practice. He says that um, the law and praxis of the church require that a heretic be denounced before he loses his jurisdiction. Our argument, he says, is confirmed by the current praxis of the entire church. No one avoids his pastor, even for the reception of the sacraments, as long as he is allowed to remain in his benefice, meaning his, his office. Even if the man is, in the judgment of all, or at least the, of the majority, a manifest Jansenist and rebellious against the definitions of the church. So in other words, that's, that's how it worked in his day. Um, and that's more than 100 years after St. Robert Bellarmine. Um, it didn't matter if someone seemed to be a, a manifest heretic by by rebelling against the definitions of the church, by saying heretical things publicly. As long as he was tolerated by the church, um, allowed to remain in his benefice or office, then he was still considered to be a minister of the church, and the faithful could, with security of conscience, approach him for the sacraments, including those like confession that require jurisdiction. And I think this testimony is very powerful. It's not something that we can lightly ignore or brush aside. Sure. This was this was the normal practice of the church, and so you, it, it's it's difficult again to take the the abstract and then compare it to the to the reality of of how the church has been practicing through the ages. It just and if those two disagree, there's a problem. Well, yes, and and so that's why I would say that the practice of the church is in fact a very sure argument in favor of the opinion of of the Thomists, of Cajetan, John of St. Thomas, and others, who say you need a sentence of the church um, before before a person can be considered a manifest heretic in the canonical sense, before he can be considered to have lost his office and jurisdiction. That sentence is not something optional. Um, and I would, in fact, say that we can go back farther than um, BOR or even the contemporaries of St. Robert Bellarmine, such as, you know, Cajetan, John of St. Thomas, who argued against him. We can go back to St. Thomas Aquinas himself. Let's look for just a moment at the teachings of the angelic doctor, because I think that, in fact, if we bring together a few passages of his, he gives a very clear answer to this question. And it, and it becomes very understandable that all the Thomists, all those who are close followers of St. Thomas, have taken the position that they have. So if you'll allow me just to quote a few passages from the Summa Theologica. Um, we, we start with the article um, in the Secunda Secunde, um, question 11, article 3, whether heretics ought to be tolerated. And this is very important, so just, just listen to what he says. St. Thomas says that with regard to heretics... On their side, there is the sin whereby they deserve not only to be separated from the church by excommunication, but also to be severed from the world by death. So just pausing there, their sin of heresy makes them deserving to be separated from the church. It doesn't separate them automatically. It just makes them liable to separation by excommunication, is what St. Thomas says. To pick up with the quotation, on the part of the church, however, there is mercy which looks for the conversion of the wanderer. Wherefore, she condemns not at once, but after the first and second admonition, as the apostle directs. After that, if he is yet stubborn, the church, no longer hoping for his conversion, looks to the salvation of others by excommunicating him and separating him from the church, and furthermore delivers him to the secular tribunal to be exterminated thereby from the world by death. Um, so that's, I think, very clear. Um, it's not right away that the heretic becomes separated from the church by his own sin, but rather it's the church who, after warning him, after being patient, eventually effects, makes the separation happen by her sentence of excommunication. Did St. Thomas have it wrong? I have a hard time thinking right. that. <laughs> and, and again, looking back to what Saint, uh, Pope St. Pius X said, this is... 
you, you when in doubt between two theologians, you default to St. Thomas Aquinas. Follow St. Thomas, exactly. And this is not an isolated quotation. I think we can, we can also produce other testimonies. For example, he says, um, in speaking of you know, wicked men who, who administer the sacraments, he says, as long as a minister of the church is tolerated in his ministry, he that receives a sacrament from him does not communicate in his sin, whether it be the sin of heresy or something else. There's no distinction here. But he communicates with the church from whom he has his ministry. In other words, for us, it's enough that the man be tolerated by his superiors in his, in his office, in his position. And it would be, you know, a very disorderly way of governing the church um, if our Lord Jesus Christ had instituted such a th uh, things in such a way that a man could, you know, s lose his office and still be tolerated in his ministry. Um, but no, for St. Thomas Aquinas, the fact that a man is tolerated in his ministry is a sign that, yes, he still possesses his office validly, and his, his acts are, are, are valid. He's still a minister of the church. Um, but I think the most explicit of all the statements here um, would be taken from the supplement um, of the Summa. Uh, so question 19, article 6. And for those of you who may object and say, well, the supplement was written after the death of St. Thomas Aquinas, um, this, this reply of St. Thomas is actually copied from his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard, Book 4, Distinction 19, Question 1, Article 2, uh, Questioncula 3. So <laughs> it's, it, this is St. Thomas for sure. This is real. Um, and St. Thomas says, Since it is by appointment of the church that one man has authority over another, so a man may be deprived of his authority. When you hear authority, think jurisdiction. This is the same thing. So a man may be deprived of his authority over another by his ecclesiastical superiors. Consequently, since the church deprives heretics, schismatics, and the like uh, of jurisdiction by withdrawing their subjects from them, either altogether or in some respect, in so far as they are thus deprived, they cannot have the use of the keys, um, which is a metaphor for this power of jurisdiction. So it's very clear there that it's the role of the church to deprive these men of, of their jurisdiction, of their authority. Um, and, he, and he makes it even more clear in his reply to the third objection, in which he says that sin of itself, and here he this includes you know the sin of heresy, the sin of schism, sin of itself does not remove matter meaning the people who are subject to a person's jurisdiction, as certain punishments do. St. Thomas is saying that the punishment that the church inflicts on the heretic um, does remove from him um, his flock, those who he had jurisdiction over previously. His sin of heresy does not do that, but the punishment of the church does. The last of these testimonies is regarding um, well, whether it's permissible to receive communion from heretical, excommunicated, or sinful priests and to hear Mass said by them. So again, we're dealing specifically with, with this question of heretics. Um, St. Thomas replies, Heretics, schismatics, and excommunicates have been forbidden by the Church's sentence to perform the Eucharistic rite. And therefore, whoever hears their Mass or receives the sacraments from them commits sin. But not all who are sinners are debarred by the church's sentence from using this power. And so, although suspended by the divine sentence, yet they are not suspended in regard to others by any ecclesiastical sentence. Consequently, until the church's sentence is pronounced, it is lawful to receive communion at their hands and to hear their mass. And St. Thomas goes on um, to quote St. Augustine, um, or, or rather, yes, um, St. Augustine, who's commenting on the instruction of St. Paul not to even eat with someone who is, you know, a bad influence or, or a heretic. Um, and St. Augustine, quoted by St. Thomas here, says, um, in saying this, he, St. Paul, was unwilling for a man to be judged by his fellow man on arbitrary suspicion, or even by usurped extraordinary judgment, but rather by God's law, according to the church's ordering, whether he confess of his own accord or whether he be accused and convicted. 
In other words, if if you know you or I say, well, I think that that Pope Francis is a heretic because of things that he said. There's been no sentence of the church declaring this, um, but I think so, and so I think that I have to avoid him as a heretic and consider him to be outside the church. What I'm doing there is I am I'm using usurped extraordinary judgment in in the language of St. Thomas. That is not my judgment to make. Um, it's the judgment of the church to pronounce on on a heretic, especially if he holds holds office, has jurisdiction in the church. It's it's the uh, it's the duty, it's the the office of the church to make that judgment and not of the individual. Um, so so this is very important. In all these passages it's clear that this, the sentence of the church is the decisive element in separating a heretic from the church's juridical structure and depriving him of his, his office, the authority that he has within the church. All right. That makes sense. We, we can't judge. It is up, for the church, up to the church to, to make this official, to make this pronouncement concrete. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, have there been we, – we've talked about some other, some other theologians um, who have – disagreed with what St. Robert Bellarmine has, has said. Um, could we go through some of those just for a minute? Absolutely. So um, I did mention some of them by name already, but it's good to quote some of the most relevant passages from them. And we'll see that, in fact, they're just following the same position, the same mentality of St. Thomas Aquinas himself. So we have John of St. Thomas, who, who writes on this topic in his disputation on the authority of the Supreme Pontiff. And he says, uh, responding to Bellarmine, he says, we respond to Bellarmine's reasoning in this way. So St. Robert Bellarmine said a manifest heretic is outside the church. If you're outside the church, you can't have jurisdiction. You can't have authority. You lose it automatically. Um, And he responds, one who is not a Christian, both in himself, um, that is by, you know, having committed the sin of heresy and in relation to us cannot be Pope. However, if he is not a Christian in himself, because he has lost the faith, but in relation to us, he has not yet been juridically declared as an infidel or heretic, no matter how manifestly he be such according to private judgment, he is still a member of the church as far as we are concerned, and consequently he is its head. It's a very clear statement, and it's following right on um, the, the the heels of what we just read from St. Thomas, that, um, you know, um, a, a sinner who has not yet been um, in, condemned by any sentence of the church, although he may be um, suspended by the divine sentence, to use the language of St. Thomas, yet he's not suspended in regard to others by any sentence of the church. And so he remains a, a minister of the church and, and can be lawfully approached for the sacraments. Um, uh, then the other quote, the other authority that I want to, to quote from is, is Father Paul Lehman, um, who wrote a very important um, uh, basically textbook of moral theology in the, the 17th uh, century. So this would have been around the, the same time he was contemporary with St. Robert Bellarmine and, and John of St. Thomas. And his textbook was used, or, or his, um, yes, his textbook of moral theology was used in many seminaries for the formation of the clergy. So, so his, his um, opinion is, is certainly of great authority. And he wrote that the Supreme Pontiff, insofar as he is a private person, can become a heretic. And by private person, we understand insofar as he's not, you know, defining dogmas ex cathedra, because when the Pope, you know, d- defines something, infallibility will prevent him from erring, let alone from, from teaching heresy. But insofar as he's a private person, not defining truths infallibly, he can become a heretic. Nevertheless, as long as the Pope is tolerated by the church and publicly recognized as the universal pastor, he really continues to possess the power of the papacy, so that all of his decrees have no less force and authority than if he were truly a believer. The reason for this is that it is expedient for the well-governing of the church, even as in any other well-constituted commonwealth, that the acts of a public magistrate remain valid as long as the magistrate remains in his office and is publicly tolerated." And that, once again, is coinciding perfectly with what was said by St. Thomas Aquinas, where he noted that as long as a minister of the church is tolerated in his ministry, he that receives a sacrament from him, or, or who that you know considers himself to be subject to him in some way, 
does not communicate in his sin, but communicates with the church from whom he has his ministry. In other words, as long as the church tolerates someone in his ministry, that, that person, even if you know he be guilty of the sin of heresy, is still um, a member of the church juridically or in relation to us and is still a lawful and valid office holder. He still has his, his authority in the church until um, a sentence is passed against him. And in the case of the Pope, if a sentence is impossible, then that means simply that he remains always um, canonically an occult heretic and cannot lose his office for his, his publicly heretical statements, provided that he continues to profess to be Catholic um, and to, you know, believe, uh, let's say, in theory, to believe what the church teaches. Um, then the teaching of individual heresies is not sufficient to make him a, a canonically manifest heretic. He has to leave the church of his, of his own authority, uh, of his own accord. He has to abandon the church of his own will. Um, and for as long as he does not and, and continues to claim to be, um, you know, the, the Pope and, and the teacher of the Catholic faith, then his heresy is not uh, canonically manifest. It's very interesting. Um, again, for the I, I forget what the principle is, but I think you and I spoke about it when we did the crisis series uh, a few months back that there's this principle that whoever holds it, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt that they that they hold it, and it is for the good of of the people. It is good for the good of the faithful. Whether we're talking about a temporal ruler or uh, a spiritual ruler, for the good of the faithful, you have to assume that that person has that authority. Precisely, and and let's let's put it though from the perspective of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is establishing the church. Um, would our Lord want to establish the church in such a way that we could be deceived in this in this very damaging uh, manner? You know, if for example, um, if we are simply doing what we ought to do and, and giving the superior the the benefit of the doubt, continuing to recognize him, and in fact. Um, the, the church is constituted in such a way that the man has, has ipso facto lost his authority. Um, the result is that the rest of the church is, is led innocently into a grave error, into recognizing a man as, as pope or, or in other cases as, you know, uh, the, the diocesan bishop or whatever, when in fact he's not. Um, and this is precisely what is so disturbing about the Sedevacantus thesis, especially as it's applied in our day, is that the, these um, Sedevacantus are claiming that the whole church, practically speaking, the whole church is adhering to, is recognizing a man as her head, um, who is not, in fact, her head. And, you know, if you're going to quote um, authorities such as St. Alphonsus de Liguori um, in favor of this, this thesis of ipso facto lo loss of office, because St. Alphonsus also teaches the same thing, um, you can't ignore the other quotations taken from the same people regarding the validity of this universal and peaceful acceptance of a pope. It is St. Alphonsus de Liguori, as well as Cardinal Bio, who's a, who's a close follower of St. Robert Bellarmine. Um, St. Alphonsus de Liguori teaches that um, when the whole church peacefully ad adheres to a man as Pope, that is an infallible sign of the validity of his election, of the fact that he truly is Pope. Because God could not permit the whole church to adhere to an anti-Pope, an imposter. Um, so that's, that is a clear teaching of St. Alphonsus, Cardinal Bio, and other theologians, which is uh, either ignored or denied by, by Sedevacantus. So I guess to, to wrap up this section, Father, um, how, how are we to see St. Robert Bellarmine after all of this? Um, great question. Well, first of all, um, our thesis in practice um, doesn't depart too much from his own um, if you interpret the term manifest heretic in a strict sense. Um, and so I'm going to quote uh, Cardinal Bio, who I said is a close follower of St. Robert Bellarmine and follows him in his opinion on the topic of a heretical pope. And we're going to see that if we take the term manifest heretic or a cult heretic in the proper sense, then in fact, there's not a great divergence in these opinions when they are applied in practice. Um, so Cardinal Bio says, um, those also are occult heretics who do indeed manifest their heresy by external signs, but not by a public profession. You will easily understand that many men of our times fall into the latter category. Those namely who either doubt or positively disbelieve matters of faith 
and do not disguise the state of their mind in the private affairs of life, but who have never expressly renounced the faith of the church. And when they are asked categorically about their religion, declare of their own accord that they are Catholics. In other words, um, it, you could adopt the position of St. Robert Bellarmine, but as long as you understand the concept of a manifest heretic in a very restricted way, the person basically has to no longer identify as Catholic, no longer claim to be Catholic, then in fact we're in agreement. Because even um, the, the theologians that we've quoted who say, um, you know, you need a sentence of the church, they're talking about a man who says heretical things but still claims to be um, a, a minister of the church, still claims to have the faith of the church. And there, because of that, you know, those two claims that the same man makes, which are logically in, in opposition to each other, logically contradictory, um, you have this doubt. Um, and that's where a sentence of the church is needed to clarify things, you know. Um, but when a man makes no longer any pretension to be Catholic, no longer identifies as Catholic, um, expressly renounces the faith of the church, then fine. You don't need a sentence of the church there. And that's the way in which um, you know a theologian like like um, Cardinal Beale understands Saint Robert Bellarmine's thesis. And in fact, you know there are lines in Saint Robert Bellarmine which would tend to indicate that this is how we should understand him. Um, for example, where he says, as we've already quoted, it is certain whatever one or another may think that an occult heretic. If he be a bishop or even the supreme pontiff, does not lose his jurisdiction until either he publicly separates himself from the church. So that doesn't sound like just making a, a, a heretical statement in public like, like the post-conciliar popes have done. Um, until he either publicly separates himself from the church or being convicted of heresy is unwillingly separated. And who will convict him of heresy? It's not going to be you or me in the pews saying, I think this man is a heretic. Um, so understood properly, his thesis is acceptable. Uh, the whole problem comes from, you know, where he introduces the example of, of uh, Nestorius and, and um, gives the impression that just saying heretical things in public is enough to be a manifest heretic. That's where we would disagree if indeed St. Robert Bellarmine holds that that is sufficient. Um, so, so really, I think we are in agreement with St. Robert Bellarmine. Um, as regards the more important things, as regards his, his more fundamental theses, and specifically, it was very dear to St. Robert Bellman's heart um, to defend the visible church, uh, to defend the idea that the church is hierarchical, and never would he take this thesis of his to the point of concluding that a whole series of popes for 63 years have been anti-popes and that the church's hierarchy has disappeared. Never would he agree with that. And and if he had to choose, I think, between saying that on the one hand and renouncing his his opinion about a heretical pope and, and this, you know, ipso facto loss of, of, of office, I think he would choose to renounce his own opinion on this matter because the other thing is beyond dispute. There is no question that the church must always have a visible hierarchy. Um, as we've seen from Vatican I, um, from the you know statements of Pope Leo the Thirteenth and and from others as well, um, and it's Saint Robert Bellarmine himself who writes in his, his work on the Church Militant, which I recommend to any any set of vicontists to read in its entirety. Read that whole work on the Church Militant. He says that um, the visible Church is indefectible. The visible Church. Note that term. Um, and indefectible means incapable of you know ceasing to to exist. The visible church is indefectible, and by the term church, we understand not one person or another, but a multitude gathered together in which there are prelates and subjects. But if the set of Acontists of today are right, there are no prelates in the church. There are no residential bishops who have been validly appointed. And so in their conclusions, they contradict other other teachings of St. Robert Bellarmine that I think are far more fundamental to his understanding of the church. And so I would say that, in fact, we are the ones who are in agreement with St. Robert Bellarmine, even if we may, you know, um, challenge this or that thesis or the way that some people have understood it. We're the ones that ultimately agree with him upon his, you know, his fundamental principles of ecclesiology. So just to just to bring this all back to where we started from, Father, um, these recent statements by Pope Francis, they are in disagreement with previous teachings of the Church. They are in disagreement with previous teachings of the Popes. 
even if we can call them heretical statements, we cannot use these basically as ammunition to say that Pope Francis is no longer the Pope. It just doesn't follow. Exactly. It, it does not follow with necessity. Um, even if you are, are of the opinion that St. Robert Bellarmine holds, that a manifest heretic loses his office before a formal declaration by the church, um, is it certain really that he's a manifest heretic? That term was never defined by St. Robert Bellarmine. Exactly what is required for that. Um, and never should we follow a particular theological opinion to a point that we end up denying basic doctrines of the church, um, such as what Vatican I has taught um, about the perpetual succession of, of, of popes, um, about the you know uh, permanency of the papacy as the principle of the church's you know um, the uh, unity and uh, the church's visible foundation. These things we can't call into question. Um, and and so if it's a question of choosing between one theological opinion and another. Um, for sure, we'll choose the opinion which is safer and which better better protects these doctrines of the church. And in this case, I think the safe opinion is the one that holds that um, for for a pope or any other person in the church to lose his his uh, authority, his jurisdiction, there would need to be a sentence. And without a sentence, that doesn't happen. The crime remains the crime of heresy remains canonically occult. And we've seen support for that in in texts of Saint Thomas Aquinas and of other theologians, and some of them even arguing from the practice of the church, as Bior does, um, saying that, you know, um, this is the practice of the church to wait until a sentence is given before we consider a man to have lost his jurisdiction. And I think those arguments are very powerful. And what they do is they prevent us from having to follow this line of reasoning, which ends up in uh, ultimately the defection of the visible hierarchy and, and thus the, the defection of the church. Um, we, we don't want to go there, and there's no need to, because there are solid theological opinions um, which, which don't lead in that direction. Sure. Um, as we wrap up here towards the end, Father, it, just as a matter of curiosity, and it would help to provide some context, set of a contism seems like kind of a new innovation within the church or a new invention, so to speak. Um, have there been periods of set of a contism or has this been a theory that has been accepted in the past? Absolutely. Um, well, as for its broad acceptance, this, this just comes back to the, the whole theological debate that we've been talking about, a debate that's never been authoritatively resolved. Um, but can we point to examples of men who have tried to apply this principle and say that a certain pope has lost his office for heresy, even though he had not yet been declared such? Yes, we can find ex examples of individuals and even groups that have done so, and in some cases have persevered in doing so for many years, but without exception, all of them were wrong. And I think that in, in fact provides a very valuable historical lesson um, that we too ought to be cautious. It's not prudent to rush into these kinds of judgments. Um, so there are certain councils that have set themselves in opposition to a pope and declared him a heretic and, and sought to depose him and, and have even proceeded to elect for themselves an anti-pope, such as happened, for example, in the Council of, of Basel in the um, in the 15th century, if I recall correctly the date. Um, and this council uh, declared Pope Eugene IV a heretic and proceeded to elect um, for itself an anti-pope, Felix V, who was the last of the anti-popes up until the present day set of Vicantism. Um, uh, so there was that council, um, even much, much earlier in church history. There's the Second Council of Constantinople, which, um, under the guidance of the, the Eastern Emperor Justinian, um, declared Pope Vigilius to be a heretic and, and outside the church. Um, they didn't actually issue a sentence of excommunication. There were some some hesitations there, but they were certainly going in that direction. Um we can mention Savonarola, who was a, a very you know, famous Dominican friar, a preacher and reformer of morals during the you know, corrupt um, Renaissance period of, of church history. Um, and he was very scandalized by Pope Alexander VI, um, who was you know, uh, genuinely a scandalous pope, one who was very worldly 
and it seems indulged in many vices. Um, and Savonarola um, was so opposed to the Pope um, that he uh, declared that, that he was a heretic. And for many, uh, for a long time, he said the church has been without a pastor. Because I tell you, he said in a, in a circular letter to you know all the, the princes of, of um, Italy and uh, other localities, I believe, um, he, he said, you know, I, I'm ready to give testimony um, in a council to uh, the fact that this man is is not a believer. He's a heretic. In fact, he doesn't even believe in, in the existence of God. Um, and, and so he was of the opinion that Alexander VI had lost the papacy for heresy. And other theologians have, you know, pointed back to this time in history and said, look, um, you know, whatever proofs Savonarola thought he may have had, he should not have opposed the, the consensus of the church, which universally was recognizing this man as Pope. Um, that alone should have stopped him. The universal recognition that the rest of the church was giving to Alexander VI. So these are some, you know, isolated examples. I think, though, perhaps the most telling example from history is that of the Fraticelli, um, who were kind of, uh, let's say, the, the strict observance of the order of um, St. Francis of Assisi. Um, they wanted to stick to the original rule of St. Francis of Assisi no matter what, even though, um, you know, the popes had grant, granted certain mitigations. And um, so there was a certain uh, monk, Angelo, um, who wanted to um, kind of found a reformed um, group of Franciscans who would adhere to the original rule of St. Francis in all of its, all of its original rigor. Um, but when Pope John XXII refused to give um, authorization um, for this congregation, um, Angelo erected it anyways and um, uh, founded in this independent Franciscan order known as the Fraticelli. Um, and he and his followers denied that John the 22nd was really Pope, um, since he had abrogated the rule of St. Francis, which according to them was, was basically the gospel pure and simple. I'm, I'm taking this from the Catholic encyclopedia, their article on the Fraticelli, which is worth reading in its entirety. Sure. And so apparently these, these, uh, monks, the Fraticelli, um, they asserted that the decrees of John the 22nd were invalid that all other religious and prelates were damned, and that the commission of mortal sin deprived priests of the sacerdotal dignity and powers. So they fell into certain other other errors regarding this, this question of you know jurisdiction and, and uh, the powers possessed by ministers of the church. Um, but what's important is, or what's, what's interesting is that this denial was not only extended to John the 22nd, but also to his successors. They persisted in this, in this kind of set of a contism. Um, so, so again, this all began in the year 1318. Um, that's when the Fraticelli originated. And we can go all the way to the year 1389. Um, so that would be how many years? 71, I think. Um, something like that, since the founding of their congregation. So that's an even longer period than what we've seen so far from from the death of Pius XII until now. And um, they were still holding to this this um, this idea that John the Twenty Second and all of his successors had been anti popes. Um, for example, one of one of their um, you know most important members, uh, Fra Michel Berti, um, who was a member of the Ancona branch of the Fraticelli. After preaching the Lenten uh, course to his associates in Florence, we're told that he was arrested on the 20th of April, 1389, and was condemned by the Franciscan Archbishop of Florence to be burned at the stake. Um, and this, this man, uh, Fra Michel Berti, he died uh, chanting the Te Deum, while his followers, unmolested by the authorities, exhorted him to remain steadfast. And to the very end, he maintained that John the 22nd had become a heretic by his four decretals, that he and his, and his successors had forfeited the papacy, and that no priest supporting them could absolve validly. So you see this, this persistence of this, of this schismatic group um, for, for, it looks like, more than 70 years. You still have these men who are claiming that this whole succession of popes were anti-popes, were invalid, that they were heretics and had lost the papacy for their heresy. I think it's a fascinating parallel. And we see again, you know, that they were men of austerity, of good intentions. Um, even the man dies, you know, being burned at the stake and chanting the Te Deum and being supported by his followers to remain steadfast. Um, and that's precisely what I think we see in the set of Vicantis today. It's a very dangerous position because, you know, history has judged the Fraticelli and has, has not judged them favorably. Um, and I'm afraid that those who, 
who like the Fraticelli um, think that they can declare a whole series of popes to be invalid, anti-popes, um, that they ris- run the risk of, of being um, considered in the judgment of, of the church and in the judgment of history as schismatics. It's, it's a real danger. Right. Father, this has been uh, fascinating, and this has been longer, I think, than any other podcast we've done. But I think it's been important for us to go through it very clearly, very specifically, going through all of these different stages. Um, because, again, this is, you know, set of accountism is something that is infecting, I would say, the church, but especially the traditional Catholic movement um, mm-hmm. very strongly, especially in recent years, which is uh, disheartening, um, in my opinion. Indeed, it's it's something that we have to be on the lookout for, and and I think that we ought to um, seek guidance in the example of Archbishop Lefebvre, who who of course himself um, toyed with this idea. He knew of the thesis of Saint Robert Bellarmine, and often, in fact, spoke about it. And after events such as Assisi, where John the John Paul II had you know allowed for this public worship of, of false gods, even a statue of Buddha to be put on top of the uh, you know altar in in Assisi. Um, you know, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre very understandably was shaken by this and said, is it possible that this man be Pope? Um, but but always with his, his customary prudence, he understood that, in fact, the visibility of the church and of her hierarchy is something too fundamental for us to call into question. And in fact, there is nothing obliging us to embrace this theological opinion that as soon as a man, um, you know, says something heretical in public that he's lost his office. There are many reasons to think that that's not true. And most of all, if it leads us into dangerous waters where we find ourselves um, rejecting much more fundamental teachings of the church considering concerning her own, you know, divine constitution, her visible hierarchy, we can't go there. Right. That makes sense. Father, thank you again so much and uh, look forward to having you on at at another time. I know this was a big one, so we'll let you relax for a little bit. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Andrew. It's always a pleasure. You too. God bless. Thank you for listening to and watching the SSPX podcast. In the meantime, if you like what you've been seeing and hearing, please consider a small donation to help support this work. It is free for you to listen to, view, and share, but you can imagine the resources these take please visit sspxpodcast.com, click on the support link, and consider a small monthly or a one-time donation of $5 or $10 or $20. If you're not able to support this apostolate monetarily, you can help by sharing these episodes with friends and family members and by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And of course, the best thing to do is to help with your prayers. This project would be nothing without the priests who take their time to share their experiences and knowledge with us. So please pray for your priests. Thank you for listening, and until next time, God bless you.